Okay, hi, good morning, everybody. Y'all are on mute, but I'm sure you're saying hello and uh, y'all, your warm greetings here. Good morning, good morning, Sage. Uh, thank you. Today, we're going to talk about uh, text mining, uh, largely with the uh, uh, tidy text package. Uh, a little bit different setup today than uh, in previous weeks. I don't have a slide deck to go through. I'm just going to go through the actual output itself. And uh, in our studio, what you want to do is go ahead and pull up uh, week seven. I'll do the same. And the file I'm going to want you to open is uh, week seven with the suffix fill on it. So week seven has all the answers. Week seven fill has a few fill in the blanks. So this is the one that I would like you to open. Um, as we've done in the past, if you want your layout to look like mine, you know, you go to Tools and Global Options, Tools, Global Options, and then uh, Pane Layout to put your source, your console, and then just your history down here. Uh, that's to make it look like mine. You can obviously have it look however you'd like. Uh, our studio wants me to wants to give another shot at uh, uh, warming up this morning, so that's so that's fine. So go ahead. Uh, while I start talking, open up uh, week seven and uh, the file with the suffix fill uh, on it. So we're going to talk about text mining today. Let me pull up uh, something else while we're doing this. Uh, text mining is uh, something that I, you know, I, I, I thought I did for the first time uh, a few years ago in this paper I'll show you, but I actually remembered that I did some text mining back in uh, graduate school. I didn't think of it as text mining back then, but it it was. Uh, I was doing um, some classes in a uh, political science department as well, and uh, in political science, it's common to do event analysis. And there was a whole literature around kind of going on to Lexis Le Lexis Lexis Nexus. It's hard to say and uh, grabbing uh, wires, you know, like the AP wire, um, AFP wire, things like that, and uh, creating a data set around events. Could be, you know, shooting terrorism events, but using public, publicly available data reporting on that to create a database of, you know, when things happened, who was injured. And uh, my, my work was in Uganda at the time, and uh, the communities where uh, you know, I had been working were affected by the Lord's Resistance Army. And uh, I had this idea to put together an event analysis using uh, wires about uh, attacks by the uh, LRA. And um, I had a colleague at the University of South Carolina that was pretty handy with coding. There was no, I mean, R existed, but there was no R studio. This is back in um, 2006. And um, uh, you can see here, that uh, these are my files. I found them on Dropbox last night. So this is a little bit later on. I was working at the analysis stage, and um, as I say here in the caption, you know, naming these files like an animal uh, using SPSS. So uh, look at where I am now. So if you feel like you don't, you're you're not really sure what this is all about, and you're just getting started, and everyone knows more, uh, that's always true. Uh, and here's evidence that. Uh, my my practices weren't always uh, uh, up to snuff. So my my first text mining was back in graduate school, and then just a few years ago in uh, the work I do with uh, Nivi, which is a digital health company that we spun out of Duke here a couple of years ago, is we we have it. We a few years ago we had this corpus of you know, 180 thousand text messages, and I needed a way to analyze them. And uh, I got pretty lucky, and you're lucky too, is that. Uh, this tidy text package uh, was created by uh, Julia and, and David, and they have a whole book uh, that goes along that accompanies the tidy text package. Yeah, they have a book in print, but it's also um, one of these book down books online, which is just such a wonderful uh, resource uh, updated just a few days ago, you can see back in, uh, back in March. Uh, so there's a link to this in the in the workshop materials, but uh, I use this package and I'm going to show you today to do this uh, analysis for this paper that we published in uh, Gates Open Research. Um, open the PDF here and just scan through uh, 
some of the figures here to give you a sense of um, what we were able to what we were able to do. So you know we're looking um, you know, very descriptively in the beginning, like how many messages were coming in and out, right? And how many um, messages were people sending on average? And how often did we reply to messages? And how often did they reply back? And how long were these conversation threads? Uh, pretty standard, just descriptive uh, data wrangling that you've been learning uh, uh, through these past few weeks. But then we get into um, what we're going to talk about today, which is the text mining piece. You know, on the left, it's what are the most commonly occurring bigrams, you know, sequential words that go together, and what were the most common individual words used in these messages, right? Um, being able to look uh, across English and Swahili, let me show you this one, uh, most commonly used words by uh, men of different age groups, right? And uh, for men, it doesn't matter what age you are, uh, sex is the uh, dominant thing that you are talking about. Uh, whereas older men, um, you know, are less likely, uh, uh, here's talking about pregnancy, younger men are very concerned about that, older men, uh, not so much, right? And uh, so here, as you're going to see in Tidy Text today, we're extracting uh, these most commonly used words and then we're combining with some demographics uh, to figure out what are the most common by uh, uh, age and gender. And here, just to show you proof that, um, you know, it's, it's not quite the same uh, salience for uh, women, a little bit for, for younger women, but less so for older women talking about sex. So uh, this is another type of uh, uh, bigram analysis that I'm not going to show you today, but I'll point you to in the text mining book to see, you know, what's the network of these combinations of words. So anyway, uh, the, the context for today, uh, at least for me, was you know, working a lot in with text messages and needing to figure out how am I going to process such a big corpus, right? A lot of times if you're doing um, qualitative work, you know, maybe, maybe you did 10 interviews or 20 interviews and you can go through and you can manually read and tag things in a, in a program like um, uh, in vivo, right? And, and that's coding in a different sense. It's sort of manual coding. Uh, but, but what do you do, and I know NVivo has some uh, ability to extract words, but uh, what do you need to do when you really need to do it in a more systematic way and finding patterns that are not necessarily uh, so visible? That's where uh, packages like Tidy Text and a few others for R can uh, come in really handy. Uh, so we're going to use this uh, Tidy Text package, and uh, you know it follows the principles of tidy data that we talked about earlier in, in this series where um, each variable becomes a column, each observation becomes a row, and tables are, are by units, right? So you might have students data in one table and school level data in another table. And tidy text incorporates this idea of uh, tidy by having one token per row. And today we're going to talk about tokens as words. So we're going to split up uh, big blocks of text um, into individual lines where each word is on a line. And that's going to let us do all the summarizing and visualization that we need to, to do. All right, just a simple example here. Uh, a few lines of uh, this song, which I had never heard before, um, Time to Tidy Up, which uh, it sounds like something that might play in my house with the kids, but if you can see behind me, yeah, it, it, uh, that's not a priority uh, right now for us. But I, when we do, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll see if Alexa can play uh, Time to Tidy Up. Uh, there's a core function in tidy text that we're going to use called unnest tokens. And uh, that's going to take the individual lyrics, Time to Tidy Up, Tidy Up, Tidy Up. I don't, I don't know the beat or the, the rhythm here, but uh, it's going to put each word on its own row, right? And if, imagine we had multiple songs here or multiple authors. It would still group it by song and author, but every word would be on one on one row. This is tidy in action when it comes to tidy text. And you're going to see as we go forward here today that once you have your data in this format, 
Again, you can uh, you can do all the summarizing and plotting that you need. Uh, it's a pretty powerful function under the covers because if you notice, it did a few things. Uh, there's no there's a little bit of punctuation here. There's a comma after toys. Uh, uh, there's capitalization sometimes and not other times. It really helps when you're doing text mining to strip away all that punctuation, strip away, uh, make everything lowercase so that it matches up nicely when you're trying to combine things. And Unnest Tokens just did that automatically for us in the background. Um, and overall, uh, you can see here the um, uh, typical workflow diagram in uh, text mining analyses that uh, they put forward in the book that we have some text data that we're going to always do this first step of unnext, unnesting our tokens. In this case today we're looking at words. Um, it puts it into a tidy text format that then we can use these functions from dplyr uh, that we're very, we're very used to right now to be able to organize and summarize and count to get a summarized data set and we can continue to use these wrangling verbs in dplyr to then push everything to ggplot where we're going to do our visualizations so we start with you know even books in in the in the in the chapters they give you in text mining um, they're actually using uh, entire books from uh, Jane Austen uh, right so you can see as we get through looking at um, from the very beginning from the title page of Sense and Sensibility uh, looking across her books at how often word usage changes things like that and there's also Project Gutenberg that they point you to that if if you there are other books you wanted to look at and do a text analysis on a on a book you know for practice uh, there's there's lots of, of ways to bring in this text data um, so you bring it in unnest we do some summarization uh, with uh, dplyr and counting and then we visualize so that's the sequence we're gonna do today so have this workflow in mind as we go forward now I wanted to stick with uh, the COVID theme but I couldn't find a text analysis uh, plot that I that I wanted to reproduce for this week. I'm sure there's something out there, but I, I, I didn't come across it. I did come across something interesting just to contrast the type of work that you can do in this space. Uh, the New York Times uh, uh, put together this analysis of 260,000 words uh, from largely from Trump's uh, remarks at the coronavirus tax task force meetings. And they looked at 40 some uh, transcripts between March 9th and uh, April 17th. And this would be more of what I would think of as a kind of traditional qualitative analysis. So here's, you know, imagine the, this is a, they compiled all the transcripts into sort of one big feed. And I don't know if they used a program in the background, um, but they imagine that they put this into something like in vivo and they were then coding by selecting blocks of text, um, coding by things that are self-congratulations, exaggerations and falsehoods, right? So the colors are indicating what they were coding and this, these colors up here would be their basic code book. Uh, you know, if you've taken a qualitative class, uh, this is not, you know, how all people do qualitative research, but certainly this is a type of qualitative work. Um, but it's uh, very manual. So every time you see a blue highlight and a, and a purple highlight, um, one, of, one of the authors of this work or a staff member was actually highlighting that. Uh, it wasn't a computer going through and figuring out what should be labeled you know, self-congratulatory speech. Right? So we're gonna contrast what we're doing today uh, with this, which is definitely richer in a different way, right? To be able to go through and then pull out um, you know, illustrative quotes like you would in a typical qualitative paper uh, where we can learn different things from the type of analysis that I'll show you today. And uh, they're not uh, opposing. I think you could do them both. And I, I tried for a little bit and had to eventually give up trying to find uh, a compiled uh, source of these transcripts so I didn't have to go through and uh, do it all myself, but I, I couldn't. I was going to try to uh, show you how you do this in the text mining version, but uh, if anybody finds it, I did post on Twitter, if anybody finds it, uh, we could we could do that. Uh, so instead, I turned to another good source of uh, the president's thoughts about coronavirus, 
uh, and that's to uh, mine his uh, Twitter uh, timeline. So here's a, uh, a much uh, uh, liked um, and talked about tweet from February 24th. Um, yeah, you know, we're uh, going to show you predictive modeling next week. We, here's an example of definitely getting the prediction wrong. Uh, uh, this, uh, working with Twitter data and uh, analyzing Donald Trump's Twitter stream because it's such a, uh, has such a volume to it, uh, is very common. You can search for uh, text mining analyses of um, Donald Trump's Twitter feed, and you'll find lots of tutorials to, to walk you through it. Uh, so after today, if there's more you want about how to grab data from Twitter itself, tons of tutorials out there. Uh, there's a bunch of packages uh, that you can use. Uh, our tweet, uh, you can see here, this is just a, a few lines of their package comparison from our tweet, and the one I knew before this was Twitter with a big R at the end, um, and streamer. Um, uh, our tweet seems to have the most functionality for interacting with uh, Twitter's API, uh, you know, getting the data uh, sort of programmatically, not by hand. Uh, we're not actually gonna use these packages today because it, um, they do require you, Twitter requires you to sign up, uh, register for their use of their API. Uh, it's not, overly complicated, but it does take some steps that uh, would just be too long for us. I link out to what those steps are if you want to work with uh, Twitter data. Uh, you should follow some tutorials because they'll show you how to, uh, you're limited by how many tweets you can pull down at one time, so there are some steps for uh, how you go and build the data set that you, you want to build. Um, but uh, I, uh, I, I, go, I went ahead and prepared the CSV file for you uh, already today. Um, and the tweets span from December 10th uh, uh, until uh, yesterday about uh, dinner time. Uh, so what we're gonna do, if you're following along in RStudio Cloud, pull this back over here. Um, I, uh, I again want you to open the version of the file called um, week seven fill. Uh, the week seven without fill has all the uh, answers in it. So if you'd like to challenge yourself a little bit, it won't be too hard, uh, use the fill. If you just want to follow along, then you could use the, uh, the week seven piece. Uh, so we're going to get into here and take a look at uh, importing this data set that I prepared for you. Uh, we're using the same markdown format as last week. So I, uh, I may be running out of steam a little bit. So I'm not showing you a new markdown uh, format this week, just uh, the same old uh, kind of nicely styled HTML template that we used uh, last week. So the YAML should look familiar to you, uh, followed by some CSS that, again, you don't really have to dig into unless you wanted to change something about the CSS. And if you didn't like all of the CSS in this file, we could put it in an external file and uh, we would just call that external file up here uh, uh, in the YAML, but uh, maybe a little bit lazy uh, that I just keeping it in the in the main markdown file here. So here we get to our actual uh, text. Um, I uh, this is this is the piece I've already reviewed with you. So I'm going to keep scrolling just a little bit. Uh, the first package you'll the first chunk you'll need to run is called uh, packages around uh, line 164. So if you run that. Uh, it should give you the tidy text and tidy verse packages that we're going to use today. Uh, it also has this funky options uh, Sci pen. Uh, I have to look it up every time uh, that our studio is showing me numbers that are, appear in scientific notation. Uh, and I don't I mean, when I see the actual numbers, not the scientific notation. When you run uh, this options, uh, Sci pen equals 999, it turns that off. How do I know that? Um, uh, I search every time, turn off uh, scientific notation in R. Uh, I get to this page on uh, Stack Overflow every time, and I scroll down to the answer, and I copy that. Now, uh, a smarter version of me would put this in one of the profile files that loads when I open RStudio and it would just turn it off automatically. Uh, that would take a few seconds for me to set up and uh, I'm, I'm that lazy, uh, but that's how you would find it if you're like me. So 
we've loaded our packages and we've turned off scientific notation. These other chunks here are just showing the pictures that you saw in my, uh, in my output. And this is showing you the uh, uh, unnest. Well, it looks like I actually embedded a, um, uh, a blank here for us to look at. So this is going back to the example I gave you here of how to take some lyrics from the song, tidy up and unnest them. So if you're following along in the uh, week seven fill, what we're doing is we're taking an example of uh, some uh, few lines of the text, right? And so example now is an object that uh, holds, uh, holds our text here. And we wanna unnest these, uh, uh, so it's one word per line. And that's what the unnest function, unnest tokens function is gonna do here. But the blank is falling on the next piece around the display. What it's saying is I need some function that's gonna subset my data set. So when it goes to print, it's gonna to wanna to print uh, all uh, 39 rows. And I don't wanna print that many. I only wanna print rows one to 17 of this output. Anybody in the chat or wanna come off uh, mute and uh, guess the function here that's going to limit our data set by row numbers. Remember that function? Head would do it in a different way. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm thinking of a different function. Not select, not filter. Filter would do a row operation that if we told it to filter on something, top n uh, uh, would be one way to get at it. Slice is what I was thinking of, yes. Um, so slice uh, will, uh, will give us just rows one to 17 here uh, as well. So when we print this, you know, in my version here, uh, I got a nice little uh, cable uh, styled table, a uh, really simple table, but only rows one to 17 are, are showing. Okay, so that's your first uh, little coding challenge. So good for you. Uh, so now we're gonna get down to where we left off in the report, uh, trying to get the data for uh, the data for today. So here's where we are, and uh, we are now down to uh, uh, the import chunk on line 253. And our data, if you look in files in the, in the folder data, we have a textmining.csv file. That's the file I prepared for you with tweets from uh, early December through yesterday. So we're gonna use read CSV. Uh, I'm using the underscore, uh, the reader version of read CSV, different than the read.csv, because I had a f some struggles with uh, this CSV file. Uh, and we're gonna save it to an object, call it whatever you want. I'm gonna call mine stable genius, and then we're going to uh, take a look at what exists in stable genius. So we can run this first line and if we want, right, in our environment comes over stable genius. It has uh, 2,200 some observations and six variables. We can open it up and see what our variables are here. So we have the text in one column. We have the date and the time, like a timestamp for the text. We have the number at the time it was pulled. We have the number of retweets and the number of uh, favorites. Um, I, I limited the data set to no retweets, so it's is retweet is false, and Twitter has an ID for all of the tweets. So we could say, you know, what's the, we could sort quickly here by the most favorited uh, uh, tweet here from, from Donald Trump, and it looks like it was some link to something that he sent. Uh, and uh, the next most liked was something about missiles being launched. Uh, back when Iran uh, uh, did that, I guess. So uh, we can we can uh, now uh, make a little output here. Uh, we want to make this quick little table where we show a few rows of the data set just for explanation and just a few of the columns because not all these columns are gonna be useful for us. So uh, what is the function that would then limit the number of columns that we have? That's right. So select is uh, select is what we want here. And in this case, we don't have that many columns that we wanna call out. 
uh, we can say select text, create that, or favorite count. Um, I can look at the names of Stable Genius, uh, names of the columns. So I could have, instead of doing it which ones I want, I could have said that, uh, you know, I don't want uh, is underscore uh, retweet. I don't want um, ID underscore uh, retweet, things like that. Uh, I'm going to give it the affirmative. There's not that much typing to do. Uh, so I'm going to say I want to keep the columns text created at and the favorite count. And I'm going to use slice to show just the first 10 tweets. And I'm going to use the cable function from the knitter package with a nice little caption here that when I run that, uh, it's uh, going to look so-so in the markdown, but in the actual formatted, uh, sorry, in the actual formatted uh, report, here's what it's going to look like. It's going to keep uh, those three columns. So I'm giving the reader a, a, a little peek into our corpus of presidential tweets in this COVID, COVID era. Okay, so let's do some exploration of this uh, data set. We can start by counting the number of tweets by date and plotting. So we're going to uh, pass this just because I want to show you two different ways we could plot this. We're going to pass everything to an object P. We're going to assign it to an object P. We're going to start with our data, stable genus, and then we're going to do some things to get the data ready. And then we're going to plot the summarized data. So we, if you look at created at, let me just show you that first. And I can use class to figure out what really is uh, created at. It's a character variable. Um, but I want it to be a date, right? So it R just recognizes those as three dash nine dash two zero space. It doesn't recognize that as a date. So we're going to change it using the Lubridate package as we've done many times. You can see the format that we need to extract is looks like it's month, day, year, hour, minute. So we're going to use the MDYHM function. Uh, that's going to get it into a date format, and then. Uh, I'm going to use the date function in the same package that's going to get rid of the uh, uh, time, the hours, and, and the minutes. Because I just want to, I just want to know what the date is. So if I scroll down here, um, now I have my created at R recognizes it as a date, and I'm just getting the the actual date itself, the month, day, and year, not not the hour and minute. Because I want to group all of these tweets by by day right now, not by hour and minute. So I need to do something because I, um, I'm i going to want to count by day. So how do I set this up so that I can do something, I, I can do this counting uh, by this variable? What would be the first function I need to do to tell R that I want to um, uh, do something by another variable? Yeah, it's almost like I, I'm trying to avoid using the word group. Um, the, the functions are named well, right? I, I want to group the data set by day, right? We've established that, that it's now organized by day. And so we want to group it by day. And now we want to get a tally, uh, if you will, of uh, number of tweets by day. So what would the function be? If we want to enumerate these by day? I'm not a good thesaurus. We want to count them, right? Uh, so we want to count them. Uh, you can just you can leave this off if you want. Uh, if you do this, it's going to give you. It's just going to use the default name for the variable of the count called n. Uh, but going forward, I like to I'd like to know what those are. So those are tweets. So if I give if I pass the name argument, then uh, here I have uh, by day the number of tweets. Okay, so I have a little data frame now that uh, gives me every day how many tweets were sent. That's a lot of tweets. Um, often when you group, you need to ungroup because R will continue to think you want to do things by that variable date uh, or created at, but we don't want to do that anymore. Uh, so we want to ungroup that. We're going to use the complete function that you saw in the previous week and kind of backfill. Uh, if, if there are any days that are missing tweets, if you didn't tweet on some day, which 
I, I do think that has happened. Uh, he tweets most days, but in case there are any days where he didn't tweet, we could complete and fill the number of tweets with zero, right? So when you run down to here, it gives now our summarized data set that looks very much like this one here that we're gonna go ahead and plot. So we're gonna call ggplot on the x-axis, we're gonna put the date. On the y-axis, we're gonna put the number of tweets. And I'm going to give it a title and a subtitle and a caption. And then I'm just going to do some very basic theming to strip away things I don't like and tell it what to do with the plot title for styling. That's it. But where I've left it off is I've assigned it to P, where if you run this part here, of course, uh, and I uh, run P, you're not going to get much because I didn't tell it the geometry. I didn't tell it what geome to actually plot. That's because I wanted to show you two different versions. You could do a uh, uh, geom call, which looks like a bar plot. So let me um, let me actually run this this double chunk here. So we could do um, columns and we could do lines, right? So here are the two here are our two options. Uh, we, we could do like bar bar charts uh, here to show it by day. Uh, we could do it by line. Um, it's a little crowded. It's a little noisy to do data like this by day. So <clears throat> what we could do instead is group by week. So that's what we're gonna do in the next uh, chunk called week. Very similar setup. The only difference is we're gonna make one more variable called week. And we're gonna use this function called floor date. Now, how do I know this? Well, I explored the Luberdate package because oftentimes you wanna summarize things by, by um, date or by week or by year. And what floor date does is it um, looks at days in a calendar week and you can either make it go to the first day of the week. You can say like, okay, um, uh, give all of um, January 2nd and January 3rd, January 4th, call those all the week of January 1st, right? And January 15th, 16th, 17th, call those all the week of January 15th, for instance. Uh, so that's what we're doing is we're giving it a date, uh, a date label, but we're only giving one date per week out. So we're collapsing things down to one day per week. So we're gonna do that, we're gonna group by week. We're gonna do the same counting. So instead of grouping by day before, now we're gonna group by week. Uh, so what would go, um, very similar to before, what would go on our x-axis and what would go on our y-axis? We want, we want um, basically time and some count. So what goes on the x? We've now grouped by Created at is still the day. Um, so we have to do, the, you're on the right track. We have to do the week version of that, right? Which is gonna be uh, week. And uh, on the Y axis, uh, as before, we're gonna put tweets. I think I called it tweets. Yeah, tweets. Okay, so now when we run this, you're gonna see that, uh, you know, I, I think, hopefully you'll agree with me that plotting by, uh, Plotting by week count is a little less noisy than plotting by uh, day count. And you could choose uh, whichever sort of suits your fancy. Um, uh, I did pick an orange that people have an opinion on uh, what a hex code should be for um, people, I guess. Uh, and so this was the hex code we're using for today. Now, what we wanna do is probably look at this collection, this corpus of tweets and figure out, uh, you know, which, which tweets are about COVID, right? He tweets about a lot of things, um, but uh, we'd want to know which ones are COVID related. This data set is small enough. Remember in the stable genus, we have only 2,200 tweets. Uh, if you were doing, you know, a research study on this, uh, you know, a proper analysis, I, I think you would just probably go through and you would manually with someone else, maybe a few coders, you would go through and manually code them. Maybe you would do something like that in, in vivo because it's not so much. You know, but if you had a corpus of, um, you know, Americans tweeting about COVID and you wanted to, um, and you wanted to process it in more of an automated way, then maybe you'd use some more um, uh, automated procedures like I'll show you today, or maybe like we'll get into next week where, you know, you might hand label a small data set of a couple hundred or a couple thousand, and then you would build a classification model and sort of using some machine learning techniques to automatically label uh, tweets as COVID-related or not COVID-related. 
I want to show you some other things today. We'll, we'll, we'll take a turn to um, prediction modeling next week. Uh, so I'm going to cop out a little bit. And I scanned down the president's tweets and look for words that he, um, he typically uses when he's talking about coronavirus. And I put them all into this object called keywords. So keywords uh, is just a long string of words separated by um, uh, this bar. And what that's going to tell the function I want is it's going to read it as or. It's going to say uh, later on, look for tweets that include COVID or virus or coronavirus or corona. There's other ways you could do this a little bit more efficiently, but just to be real explicit here, it's I'm going to pass it um, a list of ors in a string. Okay, so we can start with our data stable genius here and we're going to save the output of it to stable genius with a suffix here of cov and one of the first things i want to do is i want to turn my text from if you look at stable genius uh you know some all caps some some uh, sentence case i want to turn it all to uh, lower case so that's what the to lower function is going to do so now if you look all of my text is in lower case and then I'm going to create a variable called COVID that I'm going to turn into a factor that R recognizes a little bit differently. And I'm going to say, um, if, uh, if, the, if a tweet contains uh, any of those keywords, right, any of these ors, then in my variable COVID, I'm going to put a yes. If not, I'm going to put a no. That's how you read the if else here. If else, when I search for each of these tweets, and I look for any of the words, remember this is the object keywords, when I look for any of these patterns in the column text, if it finds any of these words, label that row with a yes, otherwise label it with a no. So you can see what that looks like here. So now um, here's my text, um, and at the very end I have a new column called COVID, and it's an indicator of whether or not that text, that tweet, uh, includes one of the words I'm saying is uh, related to COVID in some way. Certainly I'm gonna miss some things with this approach. It's not perfect, uh, but we're just exploring how to do this today. So we'll go ahead and run this, uh, run this chunk, and it's going to give you uh, uh, a count of, of all of the 2280 tweets we're looking at in this corpus, uh, my approach is suggesting that about 200 of them are about COVID, right? And the others are about the other things that he often tweets about. So we might wanna plot these, right? To be able to show um, what this looks like over time, uh, the relative share of COVID versus non-COVID tweets, right? So here's the object we just created, right? Stable genius COV. It's the same data set, but you can see it now has a seventh variable, and the seventh variable is the COVID yes or no. So what we can do is we can again uh, decide whether we want to plot by week or by day. I think we're going to do it by week, right? So it's doing the same little uh, manipulation here to the, the date variables that I did before. And we're going to group by week, but we're also going to group by that COVID variable yes or no. Because what I want to do is I want to get a count. So let me show you what happens when we take our data set that has um, our, uh, we have, uh, we know with the tweet by week and we know it by whether it's COVID or not, we're gonna group by those two things and then we're gonna count by those two things. So here's what you get. You get a little data frame that looks like this. For every day, for the yes and no's, you get a count. So um, on December 8th, it looks like there were um, all no COVID tweets because um, we have zero yes COVID tweets. Makes sense, right? COVID wasn't really something that any of us were talking about back then. So, <clears throat> uh, so that's what we get. Uh, maybe I have my original date wrong. If I'm seeing a 12-8, uh, that must mean... Um, oh, sorry, what's happening here is it's not actually on 12-8. The first, the first tweet was on 12-10, but that function where we're doing the um, floor date, it's taking every, everything that week it's basically the week of December 8th. So it's calling it December 8th, right? So it's the week of December 8th. 
And the other thing that trips me up a good bit is when I don't add this drop false. Uh, let me uh, let me just take this off because the default actually, this is what it does. Um, we're going to group by and we're going to count. And when I run this, here's what we get. A bunch of no's, but for these days we don't have yeses. Because the default is, if it's actually zero for that combination, the default is not to show it. But I actually want to show uh, when there are no yes tweets or no no tweets on a particular day. So I'm adding this dot drop equals false because I don't want to drop any combinations of weak and COVID yes or no. Okay. So when we do this, then we can plot. We take our little data set here with our all of our yeses and nos, and we can plot by week and the number of tweets. But we're going to add that we want the color to be filled in by whether it's COVID equals yes or COVID equals no. And I can pass uh, into this scale fill. Fill is like what you want to color something in with. Uh, that I want the no's to be gray and the yeses to be uh, that uh, orange color we have. So when we run this now, all right, we get a plot that looks like this. Right, it's showing over time uh, the share of uh, the daily tweets that I've labeled as uh, COVID yes or, or COVID no. But you can see the denominator changes every day, right? There's a different number of baseline uh, tweets. So if you really wanted to look at the percentage of tweets every day, you can kind of eyeball this, but it's hard to, it's hard to make those comparisons. So instead, uh, we can try to get the percentage here. Um, what I'm asking you to do is fill in a few things. First, we're going to need to, we're working with a very similar uh, setup here. Uh, but what we want to do is we want to only get down to the yeses. So we're going to make a new variable called COVID P that's going to, let me show you what that looks like actually. Um, we're going to um, uh, get our count by yeses and nos, right? We do that. So we get our counts of yeses and nos by days. And then we're going to group again by week and say, um, within each week, take the sum of the yeses and nos and divide the, uh, the, the tweets by the, uh, the sum. So you can see that here a little bit more easily. By each day, um, take the sum of the 88 plus the zero, and then take the percentage of 88 divided by 88 times 100, and take the percentage here. So we have to look down to where we start having some uh, yeses. So here's the first time where it's uh, the daily total is 57. Uh, so here's 54 divided by 57 times 100 and 3 divided by 57. So it's doing the operation now by, by week. So now we're going to take this data set and we're going to plot. We want to plot just the yes percentages, right? We don't need the no's. We just want to know uh, what was the daily percentages of yes COVIDs. Uh, and uh, so we need to subset our data to just COVID equals yes. What are we going to use to uh, limit our rows by something, a feature of of what we see in the data set, COVID equals yes. So we're gonna filter, that's right, uh, down to COVID equals yes. And uh, now we wanna plot by week uh, our new variable COVID P, right? So we created this new percentage variable, right? And so we wanna limit it down to the yeses and only uh, plot the P's. So here we go, this is the data set now that we're going to plot every day the percentage of yes. So zero, 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 and then we start ramping up the percentage. So now we can plot by week and by the percentage. And what you get is a graph that's a little bit easier to interpret uh, as a percentage. And if you, I don't know, really wanted to make the point that this is a low percentage, uh, I think it's very valid to show it zero to zero to 20, but we could, um, limit the axis. I'm going to do this last piece, turn this off so we get the Y limb. So it'll go to 0 to 100 and we get a different looking graph that's equally as valid, but it shows that, you know, over time, yes, it did increase, but it's the president's, according to my calendar, still a low percentage of the overall tweets that he sends out. So let's get into the tokenization of the tweets. Remember, we need to get it to a one word 
per line. Uh, we do have to do something funky. That if you remember from the Stable Genius, uh, there are some URLs that we don't want to count. We can't do anything with these. So <clears throat> what we're going to do is I'm creating this rejects, uh, this regular expressions pattern. We're going to basically use this function uh, uh, to remove all that fits the pattern from our text. Now, rejects is one of those things, these regular expressions, I look it up every single time. Most people look it up every single time. Uh, it's not an intuitive way to be looking for these patterns. Basically, this is a little recipe to describe what consists of what types of formats URLs can take. Uh, look it up. There, I'm giving you a few resources if you want to learn more about basic uh, regular expressions, which I think is important. But for something like this, I did not spend time figuring out what it would be. Uh, I looked up what somebody else said about how they removed URLs and we're removing URLs. Right? So we'll leave it at that today. But now uh, uh, we need to take our data set. We're going to remove the URLs. We're going to make this into a date right, a proper date as we've been doing before. We want to filter to only show me the COVID yes. We want to look just at our COVID tweets. We're going to limit the data set to just two columns created at the date and uh, just our text column. And now we're going to unnest our tokens, right? And if you remember from earlier, uh, we want to make them into words. And uh, the column that we're going to use is the column text. So when I run this, it's going to turn our uh, corpus of uh, uh, coronavirus-related tweets. If I scroll down here into something that looks like this, right? So here's like one one whole tweet here, and uh, the massive Trump coronavirus supply effort that the media loves to hate. Rich Lowry. Uh, that's all one tweet where now we've made it in a tidy format down by uh, Word. So then we can take that and uh, we might need to do some uh, additional processing because words like the and to and a and and are not informative. So <clears throat> these are, there's dictionaries called stop words. So when you do a text mining, we'd say, all right, well, let's, we, we, we got it to a tidy format, but let's get rid of the words that we don't need. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to use this anti-join to say, basically, let's take our token, let's take the data set we just created. And if there are any rows where the words uh, appear in the stop words database, like the and two, we're going to drop them. So we're going to basically filter them out with an anti-join. So <clears throat> if I show you here, stop words is built into the tidy text package. and uh, it's going to remove all these words, according, accordingly, across, above, about. Uh, so it's going to look for any words that are in the stop words dictionary and uh, take it out. So when we do that, here we go. We I, I did check to make sure that none, none of our keywords, coronavirus keywords, are in the in the dictionary. But now uh, we can count the um, the most frequently used words that the president. Uh, uses in his coronavirus tweets after removing our stop words, right? So uh, we took our stop words out and then we counted by word. So how often does each word appear? Well, coronavirus in this corpus comes up 83 times. And then this weird one, AMP, comes up uh, 69 times. So I realized that that must still be a mistake, something in the CSV file. So what we're going to do is just go in and uh, you can look and see that uh, if you look in Stable Genius for, I think I said actually do that here, um, tweets with the, uh, the, the text AMP in it, it's like ampersand. Um, so our earlier processing didn't take out ampersands. So we're going to do that uh, manually ourselves. Right? So we're going to, from our, uh, from our list here of words, we're going to take out AMP. So we're not counting that. Uh, so we're going to filter out for word does not equal AMP. Now, I showed you a list, right? We have a list of these words, but it's often common to do some sort of plotting uh, of those words. So we can take our uh, tidy little list of and count them by words and just show the top 20 words, let's say, and we can reorder it so that the 
uh, in our plot that the most frequent word appears at the top. Uh, and we can flip it so that it uh, is a horizontal chart here. Uh, so we're just counting things you've done before. Uh, now we're just counting. Instead of showing it as a table, we're showing those most common words minus amp uh, as a uh, horizontal uh, bar chart here. The uh, last thing I want to be sure to have time to show you is the more sophisticated type of things you can do with the, the data. Uh, sentiment analysis is, is one of those things. Uh, there are um, sentiment lexicons built into tidy text, and there's different ways to do this, but here's one approach using uh, a few of these different lexicons uh, built in. Um, I can show you that if you run this next chunk, uh, here's what would be included in these lexicons. So here's an example. So there's the AFIN, the Bing, and the NRC lexicons. AFIN takes uh, all of these words and not words in, these are not words yet in our corpus, it's just a dictionary of words. So it takes the word uh, uh, abuse and it scores it as um, from a negative five to a positive five in AFIN, from negative to positive. Bing just does a either a negative or a positive. So absentee gets a negative valence label. And NRC, they have a few different uh, mutually exclusive categories like negative, um, sorry, it can actually appear, a word can appear in different categories like negative and sadness. So absentee and NRC would be called negative or sadness. Abuse could be given the label anger, disgust, fear, negative, or sadness, right? So depending on what you wanna do with your sentiment analysis, one of these uh, lexicons might be useful for you. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look for um, words in the president's tweets that would be labeled anger in the NRC lexicon. We're gonna do that with an inner join. We're basically gonna take all of the president's words and look for matches in the NRC lexicon um, that are tagged as anger. And then we're gonna count those and plot them. So you can see he uses the word um, bad 11 times, force nine times, crazy six times. These are all words that appear in the NRC lexicon uh, as anger words, right? Uh, maybe more interestingly, we can go back to his full collection of COVID era tweets. So get into this, this guy's mind from uh, early December until just recently and do a sentiment analysis where we kind of aggregate up the individual words to see what's the balance of positive and negative words he's using across all of his tweets in one day. And to be able to show this over time, uh, the balance of positive and negative tweets in a day. So uh, first thing we're doing is the things we did just for the COVID related data set. We're gonna tokenize all of the messages this time. I won't repeat myself here. This is just what we did before, but just not limited to COVID only tweets. This is all tweets. We're gonna get our um, um, sentiments by joining uh, all of the individual words once they're tokenized uh, with the Bing lexicon. Remember, Bing is the one that labels each word as positive or negative. So we're gonna label each of the president's words in all of his tweets as positive or negative. And then by day, we're going to count how many positive and how many negative words appear. So let me do that for you real quick. Um, we're gonna count it uh, by day. And so here on the 10th of December, we have 19 words across all of his December 10th tweets that got the positive, sorry, that got the negative valence and eight that were labeled as uh, positive. And what we need to do is we wanna take the difference between these two, right? We wanna know what's the difference between positive and negative. So we need to spread these out. This isn't a long data set. We need to get positive and negative up in their own columns. So we're gonna use this spread function to say we're gonna spread the sentiment uh, out. So when I do that, you'll see the difference is, is now uh, the data set's a little bit wider. So now every day appears once and I get the count of negative in one column, the count of positive in another column. So now I can take the difference between these two, right? So I can uh, create a sentiment score that's the positive value minus the negative value, right? And I can create another variable for my plotting that says, you know, if the, if the sentiment is greater than zero, right? If it's positive, then um, uh, 
color it uh, labeled as a one for coloring, otherwise a zero. So when I do that, just so you can make sure you understand the data set we're gonna plot here, uh, looks like this. By day, um, and here's my sentiment score for each day. And this is just an indicator of whether or not the sentiment score is positive, right? So we get a lot of negative sentiment days, right? We're on balance, he's using more negative than positive words. And on December 17th is our first positive balance day. So then we're just gonna take this data set and plot it, right? We're going to plot uh, uh, days uh, along the x-axis. We're gonna plot our sentiment score on the y-axis. And we're gonna fill it uh, by whether or not it's uh, positive or negative, right? So when we do that, all, here we get, you know, whether or not on, for each day on balance, is he tweeting positive or uh, negative things? And here you can see there's a spike in late April. It's actually April 23rd. Uh, just quick, run a quick uh, uh, um, chunk here to see that what he's actually tweeting about those weeks. Um, he had a string of going through and congratulating, I imagine, Republicans for being uh, awesome and great people. Uh, so he's using a lot of uh, really positive language on this day where he's giving shout outs to people on a list, I guess. Uh, so that's, that's, what, that's what accounts for this uh, spike of positivity in late April. Uh, the last thing that I wanna show you is, um, and we're only scratching the surface here, but we've been looking at individual words. You can also look at consecutive words and uh, we call them n-grams. And uh, when you wanna look at two consecutive words, you'd call them bigrams. And all we have to do to be able to get consecutive words is pass along to the unnest tokens um, function uh, that we want n-grams, not just single words, and how many consecutive words do you wanna look for? In this case, we're gonna look for bigrams, uh, so we're gonna look at two consecutive words. So when we do that and we separate in the words into two columns, this is gonna show us uh, the words that appear together in these tweets. So let me scroll over. Um, one of, of my, my greatest, greatest honors, honors was. So this is um, breaking every tweet down into its uh, consecutive uh, word chunks and just two consecutive words. You could do it three, you could do it four. We need to do the same thing as before. We don't want words like of and uh, uh, maybe my in there. So we're going to go through uh, both the word one and word two columns and get rid of our stop words and get rid of amp. And then we're gonna count, uh, and then we're gonna do a count of uh, how often these word pairs appear together. So when we do that, what we get is uh, this, uh, this bigram count. Um, uh, this, anybody could have bet money on what the two most popular uh, combinations of words would be in his tweet, uh, aside from uh, White House, would be fake news and impeachment hoax. Um, uh, Mini Mike is an interesting one. I, I, um, uh, I it might have been back when Mike Bloomberg was in the race. I, I don't recall. Uh, but you can see what words appear most commonly uh, together. And <clears throat> with a richer data set, you can do a lot with uh, the relationship between words. So for instance, if I go to the, the book on tidy text and they're using uh, actual book, book length manuscripts, just to give you a quick scrolling sense here, uh, you know, they're looking at across uh, different Jane Austen books, what are, you know, the most common bigrams that appear throughout the text, right? And uh, you, could, you could use this to give a little more depth to the sentiment analysis uh, that we did, right? And uh, here's an example of uh, uh, a network uh, graph. So um, here's a network of how pairs of two words uh, appear, right? So uh, the word dear appears often with Fanny Jane uh, Madam, right? And dear also appears with another cluster, another word, I can't see what it is, but then that word is clustered with other words, right? And you can do uh, sort of a correlation um, uh, matrix of sorts uh, as well. Our corpus just is not big enough or rich enough to be able to do that. So uh, for that and for time, uh, we've, we've reached the end, uh, but I've given you the link to go back if um, 
you know, looking at relationships between these bigrams would be interesting to, for your work uh, to be able to see that. So uh, that's all I uh, that's all I have for you today. Um, I'll uh, leave you with this nice this nice image, I guess. Um, if you if you go ahead and if you followed through and you uh, filled in all your uh, um, you filled in all of your blanks, you could knit and hopefully it'll work. Uh, otherwise, you could open up the uh, uh, the week seven without the, the suffix on it, and you could run that, and you'd uh, you'd get our full you'd get our full report here. So maybe I'll leave you with this image. I'll stay on if folks have questions. You bet. Thanks, Jules.